all fibers make you poop. That's the cool thing. It doesn't matter if you're eating an artichoke or if you're gnawing on romaine lettuce or if you're just chowing down on a bunch of chia seeds. They're all going to contribute to helping you poop. Okay, but that is the basics of fiber. That is the, the simple basics. What I want to address in this video is what fibers are really not that amazing, not that beneficial outside of the whole pooping conversation. Because that conversation is just about transit time. And insoluble, soluble, fermentable, non-fermentable, viscous, non-viscous, doesn't matter what kind of fiber, they're all gonna help you poop, okay? But we have to look at the very big picture and the big equation, which is how do these fibers actually contribute to butyrate and short chain fatty acid production, which essentially, for the long and the short of it is, that's what's gonna help our microbiome. That's what's gonna help us metabolize things. That's gonna help us with glucose metabolism, with fatty acid utilization. That's what really matters, because they all make you poop. So anyhow, let's dive in. Now, when we're talking about the world of the microbiome, people automatically think, oh, just Probiotics, okay. Well, there's this relationship between probiotics and fiber that is very, very important. And obviously we kind of touch on that with other videos, but people ask if there is a recommended probiotic that I like. So I wanted to mention today's sponsor, which is a brand called Seed. They are down below in the description. I figured it's very relevant for today's video. So they are a symbiotic, which means they have prebiotic fiber and the probiotic strains in there. So very unique and very interesting stuff. So that link is down below, which will save you a nice little chunk of change if you want to check them out. So very unique probiotics, the one that I use daily. And again, what I would personally recommend, but totally up to you. So that link's down below and a big thank you to Seed for the sponsorship on today's video. So the first one that's kind of a waste, cellulose. Cellulose is an insoluble fiber and non-fermentable. Okay. Now, I have some research to back this up, but cellulose is basically like iceberg lettuce, okay? It's, it's a fiber that's just not getting you much, okay? And it's gonna be in romaine lettuce too. It's in just a lot of just, it's also in Brussels sprouts and things like that, but those have other fibers to counteract. Like if you just look at lettuce and like iceberg romaine lettuce, lots of cellulose, it's just what gives structure. Celery is a lot of cellulose too, but of course celery has other things in it as well. Point is, is that lettuce, iceberg lettuce, romaine lettuce, probably not the greatest thing to consume. Okay, the other one that's in combination with that in this particular study, which we're gonna talk about, is psyllium. Now, you may be thinking, Thomas, you've done videos talking about the benefits of psyllium. No, don't get me wrong, I like psyllium. Okay, but when it comes down to short chain fatty acid production, it is considered a soluble fiber, but it's non-fermentable. So what that means is that it has all the benefits of a soluble fiber. It draws water into it and it swells, but it's non-fermentable, which means that it does not actually ferment and feed the gut. Fermentable means that it's feeding the little microbes in our gut. So psyllium, phenomenal for baking. Phenomenal as a just great filler that actually has a benefit. Phenomenal for drawing water into the colon. Phenomenal for transit time. Amazing for potentially like modulating the absorption of certain fats. So don't get me wrong. But anyway, let's get into the research on this one as to why. The Journal of Medicinal Foods had published an in vitro study, because in vivo studies are really hard with like short chain fatty acids in the microbiome. Okay, it compared seven different kinds of fibers and it wanted to see what is going to yield the highest short chain fatty acid production. What is ultimately the best fiber in the world of butyrate producers, which we'll talk about. Well, it took a look at psyllium. It took a look at methyl cellulose. It took a look at indigestible dextrin. It took a look at two different kinds of uh, guar gums. And then it took a look at polydextrin. And then it took a look at something called arabinogalactin, which is just a different kind of fiber. All these kinds of fibers you could see on a label. If you went to the grocery store and you looked on the back, you would see that. You'll see polydextrin sometimes. You'll see those kinds of things. Anyway, things that you could recognize. Okay, so what they did is they took feces from the consumption of these fibers. This is really kind of grody. And they let it ferment for 24 hours. That sounds like the worst possible thing in the world. I would hate to be the person in that room. Anyway, so they let the feces ferment for 24 hours associated with these bacteria. Then they were able to measure the gases to see which ones got the most short chain fatty acids. Very interesting stuff. Methyl cellulose, so cellulose, ended up producing less butyrate than glucose. So the actual short chain fatty acid production, butyrate, the main one we really focus on, was literally less than pure glucose, and it's a fiber, okay? Now, psyllium was interesting. It did produce less butyrate than the other fibers, but at least it produced more than glucose, okay? But it did produce less acetate than glucose. Does that really matter? 
Honestly, it doesn't so much with psyllium because psyllium we know is just like pure roughage. But the benefit that we actually want from fiber is the butyrate. The main short chain fatty acid, I'm gonna say this again, the main short chain fatty acid that we want is butyrate. You will hear me talk about butyrate producers. You will hear microbiome research talk about butyrate producers because we want bacteria that produce butyrate. So the fact that cellulose produce less butyrate than glucose, which isn't even a fiber, is just dumbfounding to me. It doesn't mean it's worthless. Well, it kind of does. It doesn't mean plants are bad. Let's just put it that way. Okay, moving into the next one, we have to talk resistant starches. Now, these are going to sound like some pretty foreign Greek names, but I promise you, if you start looking on labels, you will see them. They do exist. They're called resistant starches. And what's funny is, in the world of resistant starches, they are notorious for being good short-chain fatty acid producers. The whole idea of a resistant starch is it is a starch that is resistant to digestion, Therefore, when it gets into our gut, the microbiome has a chance to feed on it. So what happens when the microbiome feeds on it? They feed on it and they produce short chain fatty acids. So all resistant starches are good, right? So all resistant starches produce the same kind of things, right? Wrong. They may all produce short chain fatty acids, but they may not be producing the right kinds of things, right? So let's break this down with a cool study. So there was a study that was published in the journal Nutrition and Cancer. Okay, and it looked at different kinds of resistant starches. In this case, they gave rats, because once again, it's difficult in humans, they gave rats a control, which was just straight up maize, okay? They gave them potato starch, which you bet your bottom you can find potato starch on labels and ingredient lists, okay? Then they took a look at what is called high amylase starch, which yes, once again, you can find. And then they found, uh, and then they looked at what is called alpha amylase treated high amylase starch. That one you might not see quite as much, but high amylase wheat, high amylase barley, all these things you will see if you look for them. There's even high amylase rice and other starches. Anyway, they gave these rats this stuff for four and a half weeks and the results were very interesting. They found that high amylase starch produced the most short chain fatty acids. So all the food makers, all the ingredientologists out there, they're gonna take that to the bank, right? They're gonna say, I want this high amylase starch, high amylase wheat, high amylase barley, all this stuff. Let's put it in our food. But the levels of butyrate with the high amylase starch were significantly lower than the other ones. So just because it produced a bunch of short chain fatty acids doesn't mean that, that it produced the butyrate that we're actually after, okay? So does that mean that a resistant starch is bad? Well, yes and no. No, it doesn't because resistant starches can still have a lot of huge benefit. But imagine you already have a bunch of gut dysbiosis and you have a resistant starch that can potentially feed a bacteria that you don't want to be growing. The world of resistant starches can be kind of difficult with that. So you're kind of wondering, well, what foods do I avoid? Look on the ingredient label and if it says high amylase starch, or high amylase gluten, things like that, high amylase wheat, you probably just wanna back off of it a little bit and substitute that out for just something a little bit different. Even potato starch or even some resistant dextrin would be okay. Okay, these next ones are gonna sound like crazy fancy names because they're fibers, but then I'll give you the breakdown of what they are. Fructooligosaccharides and galactooligosaccharides. Fructooligosaccharides, the ones I'm gonna pick on the most are gonna be like onions and leeks. Okay, to some degree, Jerusalem artichoke, but here's the thing with artichoke. Artichoke has enough inulin in it where I think that kind of supersedes or kind of outweighs the negative effect of having the uh, fructooligosaccharides. Because fructooligosaccharides are not bad. It's just kind of a useless fiber, which you'll see in a second. Galactooligosaccharides, I'm gonna pick on kidney beans. I'm gonna pick on lima beans, okay? Some benefits as far as protein and other fibers go, but largely pretty high, anyway. It's all gonna make sense in a second. So this study was published in the journal Scientific Reports. It was a randomized 14-day crossover study. So very good kind of study design. So basically they gave subjects fructooligosaccharide or galactooligosaccharides. At the end of the study, they found that fructooligosaccharides reduced butyrate levels 46%. Now, granted, there's a lot of things in a study that aren't necessarily real world. Okay, galactooligosaccharides reduced by about 31%. So what's the deal here? Why are they doing this? Like, why are they decreasing butyrate? Well, the funny thing is, if you look at the surface level, you see, oh, these, these are gonna increase bifidobacterium. These fibers increase bifidobacterium. So people might even put these fibers in their foods saying it's gonna, and making the claim, it increases bifidobacterium. Bifidobacterium is a good bacteria, but is not a butyrate producer. Again, you'll hear me talking about 
butyrate producers, butyrate producers. You know what butyrate producers are? Things like ruminococcus, okay? Ruminococcus is a tremendous butyrate producer. Fascolarctobacterium is another tremendous butyrate producer. And you know what? Fascolarctobacterium and ruminococcus both were decreased when fructooligosaccharides or galactooligosaccharides were increased. So essentially what's happening is they're fibers that are feeding different microbes that are not butyrate producers. So therefore the butyrate producers are getting decreased and other bacterias are increasing, producing different short chain fatty acids, right? So the bottom line with this is that should you avoid onions and leeks? Well, no, but it's a fiber that you really shouldn't be thinking about as a fiber. And if you look at food products that are fortified by having extra fructo oligosaccharides, it's not exactly going to be a huge benefit to you, but I have to make a giant disclaimer. Transit time matters on these things. So the amount of time that something is traveling through the gut could dictate how it affects our short chain fatty acid levels. For example, there's a study published in the European Journal of Clinical Nutrition. And this was interesting because it found that transit time played a big role in the short chain fatty acid production. So what they did is they took uh, different transit times, a normal transit time, a slowed down to half transit time, and an accelerated by 2x transit time, all done with pharmaceutical intervention. Okay, then they compared this to sort of natural transit time. They found that people naturally with faster transit times had higher levels of short chain fatty acids. Interesting, the faster things are moving through the gut, the higher the short chain fatty acid content was. The pharmaceutical intervention, same thing. So even, whether it was natural or pharmaceutically intervened, if things were moving faster through the gut, there was more short chain fatty acids. There were more short chain fatty acids. So what this essentially is at least alluding to is that the more fiber that you eat, the faster things move and the more efficient the whole process might be. So if you were to suddenly say, take someone that doesn't eat a lot of fiber, doesn't have the best transit time, give them a bunch of fiber, it could negatively affect transit time and play a role in this. So I guess I say this to say, it doesn't mean that these fibers are bad because there's a lot of different confounding factors and things that change things. But just to recap, cellulose, lettuce, things like that, don't bank on it as a fiber. Psyllium, bank on it as a fiber for pooping, but not for much else. And it tastes pretty good when it's baked and stuff, right? Okay, next is going to be the different resistant starches. Don't lean in to the high amylase starches, okay? Not gonna matter too much for you. The onions, the leeks, the lima beans, and the kidney beans, although delicious, they just don't think of them as a beneficial fiber. So you might be thinking like, what fibers do I add in? Uh, let me give you a few. Artichoke is still great. Asparagus is still great. Brussels sprouts are phenomenal. Okay, chia seeds, tremendous. Big fan of uh, chia seeds. Flax seeds, big fan of going with the flax seeds as well. Things like that are things that you really want to be leaning into. You want to be leaning into the higher inulin foods, the higher inulin starches, as those are tremendous when it comes down to being butyrate uh, producing. Okay, doesn't mean that you have to avoid these foods entirely. Just pay attention. As always, keep it locked in here on my channel. I'll see you tomorrow.